position goes from tonic to dominant, and the development begins with that dominant harmony, but then it goes through a lot of you know, related keys, but then it returns to dominant at the end of the development, at the retransition, and then resolves to tonic at the recap. So that's an example of this basic pattern being something which um, is the organizational factor. The texture of the classical period is homophonic in general, and so poly polyphonic passages like we saw in the development of the first movement of the Mozart Prague um, get a sense of contrast and create tension. And so that's typically where you'll see polyphonic writing would be the development sections of Sonata Allegro movements. The genres that are listed here, we'll, we'll look at all of these um, during the semester. So symphony, uh, these are all examples of sonata cycle works. Solo concerto, solo sonata, string quartet. Um, under vocal genre, what we'll do, we will talk a little bit about the uh, 19th century German art song at the end of the semester. So we'll look at that vocal type. Under form, ternary form, it says predominant, so that ABA kind of pattern, uh, Sonata Allegro developed. We've talked about the term absolute music, and so the term absolute form is associated with that. What did absolute music have to do with? What was that? Lack of a program. Yeah, lack of a program. So something that's abstract. And so absolute forms are like Sonata Allegro form. All right. Th this music was written um, for both, you know, secular um, audience, but it was still an aristocratic audience. It was still associated with the privileged class. And so we don't really have the, the popularity that we're going to see in the 19th century of public pay concerts that people would buy tickets to and, and attend. Um, this, this music of the classical era is still intended for magnificent, you know, mansions and, you know, the, the you know, wealthy, the, the upper class, or in the court. Um, so that was m more than what it was happening in the church in the classical period. So it was more secular than sacred. Um, and that's in contrast to, to earlier styles, which for sure featured more sacred, right? <coughs> All right, the dynamics in a work like the Mozart Prog have this sense of continuous change, and that's something that's in contrast to the Baroque, and we already talked about this as far as performance directions that composers begin to write more and more into the score as the common practice period progresses. So we'll see in the Romantic period that the composers will write much more detail and then they extend the extremes of the range. So in a Mozart work, the softest that you'll see is pianissimo, two piece. Um, 19th century, we'll see that extended to being like four pieces. So at um, any rate, that's, that's more than obviously what you had in the Baroque style. And then the timbre, which has to do with the color aspect. You had changing tone colors between sections of work. So we talked about that term, changing points of color. And so that describes the orchestration style of changing the combination of instruments from one moment to the next. Basically, in a symphony, it's, it's emphasizing the strings and the winds. And so, but you have different combinations that are possible. And so that's something that's always giving contrast. The orchestra at this point was basically 30 to 40 players. And one thing that you should know in connection with that is the typical orchestration of a classical symphony. So I will ask you that in the first test. So you should be able just to describe the number of wind players and brass and strings and um, timpani. So the piano also becomes really, really important in the classical period and continues into the 19th century. Then this idea of virtuosity and improvisation um, is basically limited to, to cadenzas and concertos. And so 
that idea of improvisation, which I already mentioned this with the Baroque period, there's a much greater sense of improv than there is in the classical period, and then even less so uh, in the Romantic era, as far as um, being a basic part of the style. And then the way that emotion is expressed is in a way that's balanced and restrained. So that idea of self-imposed restraint is an important feature of classicism. So start looking over this and be sure that you know all these terms, how, how to use these terms, because this is what I'll look for when we get to the second test. And I ask you to write about um, musical style. And so you'll be writing about you know, the example that you see. And so I want you to say these kind of things with you know, um, a limited range with the melody or conjunct writing or diatonic or whatever. All right. Now, the next composer that we're going to study is Franz Joseph Haydn. So the dates of his life were 1732 to 1809. He's an Austrian composer, just like Mozart. Unlike Mozart, Haydn was not a, a, a child genius. He wasn't someone who was um, internationally famous as a child. Um, he was uh, a rather modest performer, so he wasn't a virtuoso like Mozart was. But he's someone who steadily developed over his career, and he was uh, very prolific and had a profound influence on classical music. So he landed a really important position And this was with a Hungarian prince. And it was with the family Esterházy. So Nicholas Esterházy was his employer. And he was Hungarian. So this is a really important name to know associated with Haydn. So Haydn worked really well in the patronage system. Mozart did work so well. A lot of it had to do with the personality of, of the, the patron that they were working for. So Esterhazy was extremely supportive of Haydn, provided him with his own group of musicians. So he had his own orchestra. Haydn was responsible for all of the musical activity at the court. That highest musical position in a court is called Kapellmeister. So Haydn was the Kapellmeister for Esterhazy's court. And it was a magnificent structure, compound. It, rivaled Versailles in its, in its splendor. And um, so each week, Haydn would put together uh, performances and would um, was uh, responsible for writing music for these concerts, but also for doing all the rehearsals, um, for keeping the instruments in repair. Um, so he was someone who was extremely you know, hardworking would wake up every morning, you know, 5 a.m., immediately would start composing, you know, three or four hours, then would go on, you know, the next part of his day. And um, he was very prolific in composing symphonies. So in total, he composed 104 symphonies 
And for that reason, he's sometimes called the father of the symphony. I'm going to put here 104 plus because musicologists are still debating exactly how many are Haydn's or are spurious. And so unscrupulous publishers would hire you know, people to imitate Haydn's style and would sign Haydn's name to works because Haydn was really famous as he became you know, an adult and that would sell his music. And so we're still trying to kind of untangle what he wrote and what he didn't. But anyway, traditionally I think 104 symphonies and um, majority, majority of these are in major keys. Um, but there was a phase that Haydn went through in the 1770s that was known as the storm and stress period. So, So that's a phase you should know about. It's kind of a pre-romantic phase in the classical era. And it, it's, a, it's a very emotional kind of, um, you know, passing kind of uh, fad. But some of the symphonies that are numbered in the 40s are these minor keys, like La Passion. Um, and a lot of, of Haydn's symphonies have nicknames. So, all right. So in addition to the symphony, Haydn is also extremely important in developing the string quartet as the most popular and important type of chamber music in the classical period. And so um, the way that he wrote for these works is some of his very best writing. And I want to just talk for a moment about this technique of rotatic thematic development. So I mentioned that this was something that influenced Mozart, but especially associated with Haydn's style. And so we're going to see that in the first movement of the symphony that we look at here in a minute. And another thing that is um, typical, especially of later Haydn works, is the technique of monothematicism. So this is a term that you should know. What monothematicism has to do with, obviously, it means one theme. So if I ask you to describe it, I'll, I want you to put more than that. It does mean one theme, but we're going to use it within the context of sonata allegro form. And so with Haydn, Haydn will, instead of giving a contrasting lyrical B theme, when the music cadences in the second key in the exposition, he will just restate the opening A theme in that second key area. So that's a specific example of monothematicism associated with Haydn. And so he would use that a lot. It was something that gave a greater sense of unity to the movement. Um, so let's just write here. 
look at the first movement of his last symphony, symphony number 104, which is nicknamed the London Symphony. And this is what we'll see, is that instead of having a contrasting B theme, he restates the A theme when it has modulated to that dominant key. All right. So, Symphony number 104 is in D major. And it's nicknamed London. The reason that it's nicknamed London, the last 12 Haydn symphonies were written for concerts that were organized by an impresario whose name was Solomon. And Haydn was extremely popular in England. In fact, Oxford gave him an honorary doctorate. And he wrote a symphony for that, the Oxford Symphony. Um, but when uh, Nicholas Esterhazy died, he left Haydn an annuity, which is you know, a yearly sum from the estate, so he inherited a lot of money. And so he could retire, and he then split his time between Vienna and London for you know, the last um, 17 years of his life. And so one thing that Haydn uh, commented on when he was working for Esterhazy was the fact that he was um, on this estate that was about 60 miles from Vienna. And so it wasn't so easy for him to travel to Vienna. And so he felt, you know, isolated in, in a certain sense. But he stated that it really worked to his advantage because he said he had to figure out the solutions to his own problems instead of um, imitating what other people were doing. And so, uh, Haydn was more experimental with his compositions than with, with Mozart as far as, you know, working with um, the forms and, um, you know, the different uh, types of works that he was composing. And so that was something which um, he wrote about in, in a letter, that the fact that he was isolated, that actually that was an advantage for him. So with a lot of the, the string quartets, you'll see that those develop in a parallel fashion to the symphonies. And so the same things that we said about the number of movements and the keys and the forms of the symphony, you can apply that to the string quartet. They follow the same basic pattern. All right, symphony number 104, Well, it's written in 1795. It's a four movement work. It has a minuet and trio, third movement. Everything about the, the movements and the orchestration follows the classical model that you would expect. So he has paired oboes, flutes, oboes, clarinets, bassoons, and then two horns, two trumpets, timpani and the four string parts. So everything's according to what you expect. And this opening movement that we're going to listen to is very unified thematically. So if you look at the theme sheet that's on the web page that has the themes, you'll see that Haydn is going to extract two motives from that opening A theme. 